partners in this great fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I greet you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, we just want to have this fellowship together with you. And uh, it's not more of a church setting, it's going to be a little bit of a uh, subject matter that we've had for some time. And uh, I want to thank for those who've been calling back to tell us what is happening in their lives and what God is truly really doing. I want us to go straight to the scriptures. We want to pray fast. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we want to thank you for your presence in our midst. Oh, Father, we invoke you to be around us. Even Father, to speak to us about your word, Father, to understand the laws of God about you, Lord Jesus Christ, to inspire us, to bring us into the fellowship of God. Heavenly Father, may the soul of God be released to make us thirsty for the things of God, to make us, Heavenly Father, be attracted to your things, Lord. Father, we are making decisions to love you, to live for you. We are making choices every day, Father, we come in your presence. And Heavenly Father, we know, Lord, when you are done with us, you don't have to console anyone. You will call us home if you will tarry, Lord Jesus Christ. And if we have to leave this world before you come, Lord Jesus, you don't have to console anyone, Father. You will pick us, Father, and we shall be going, Lord. We want to make every minute, every hour in our life to account, Father. We appreciate you again today, Father, for the time you've given us for this fellowship. Speak to us, Heavenly Father. Manifest yourself to us, Lord. May you help us to understand stuff about our lives and about the principle of redemption and salvation where the enemy was defeated, Lord. We appreciate you. Bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want us to go straight to, we have got several scriptures here. I uh, don't want to keep you long. I want to, to keep it short like we did last Thursday. Last Thursday, we, we, spoke about, we spoke about something that is, still pleases my heart. It was about the redemption of the second Adam by the first. By, uh, sorry, the redemption of the second, of the first Adam by the second Adam. Following the laws that are laid in the book of Leviticus chapter 25 and the laws of redemption. Number one, I want to say that uh, God is the only person that declares the end from the beginning. God does not begin to work on something that he hasn't finished. God completes something before the thing itself commences. God ends something before he begins it. That's how God works. God does not start something and then he takes it to the end. God already ends what he has already started. And the fact that God has started something, that in itself is evident that he has already ended it. God already knows the product of what he really wants. God is not a, a, a farmer that takes his grain in the field and is waiting for it. He doesn't know what, what is going to be. It's not subject to anything else. What we are calling your future is actually the past of God. God has already known what it is. That's what he says in the book of Isaiah, I'm the Lord. I declare the end from the beginning. He begins working when he has already ended it, when he knows the results. Upon this, we want to read our scripture here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21. We are not the book of Deuteronomy. There is only one story that God is telling us and it's the story of redemption. So I want you to follow very close because we've been dealing with the death of the Lord Jesus, the death of Adam, the death of mankind. And I want us to follow these principles as they are written here in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21. And then we shall go to the book of uh, Numbers chapter 35. We referred to it last week. We want to take a, a, a different thing about it. I hope this is going to be a blessing to you because... Preachers, we are first partakers of the blessing. We don't come here to speak something that has not blessed us. We want to be the first believers, the first partakers of the blessings of God before we bless the next person. It says here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, it says, If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him. Someone has been found in the land that God gave to the children of Israel. And there is the law here that is written in the book of Numbers 35. That law cannot be applied here 
because the person that is dead here, no one knows who killed him. The Bible says this. Then the elders and the judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are around about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of the city shall take a heifer, it says, take an heifer, which hath not been rowed with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of the city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sworn. A, a, a piece of land that has not been planted, has not been plowed before. That is where the murder is going to take place. I want to call it a murder. But that's the place where the slaughter is going to, be, to take place. It says, And it shall be that the city in which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of the city shall take a heifer which hath not been rowed with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of the city shall bring down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of, the Le the sons of Levi, shall come near for them the the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him and to, play, and to bless in the name of the Lord. By their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of the city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley and shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and laid not innocent blood unto the people Israel, Israel's charge, and their blood shall be forgiven them, so that thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the Lord, of the Lord says. Now, we realize here there are two things that are, are, are mentioned here. There are two deaths here. There is the death of one person that is found dead in the city. And no one knows who killed this man. And the reason why God is calling for them to look for an innocent animal, which will be now the second death in the same place, is because no one is going to take responsibility and there is no witness who saw this man being killed. If there was a witness, then there was a law to that effect. The law is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 35, and God is giving a reason why he built, he allowed them to build six cities of refuge, three on the other side, as we mentioned the other time, three cities before Jordan and three cities after Jordan. And the reason for this was, Someone killed without planning. It was a death that occurred in the land of Israel. Someone went out to do some work, maybe in the woods, and uh, the axe head slipped from the handle, and without him planning, he kills a person maybe that he had gone to work with. And in so doing, the person dies. And the brother, as we said, Goel, the avenger of the blood, would run pursuing the killer to kill him because he has killed his brother. What was the reason of this brother killing a man that has killed his brother? This was not something that was really advancing what we would call an eye for an eye. That was not the, th the case here. There was a depth of the word of God that was hidden here that we need to understand. It says, I just want to read the last, the last three, the last two verses of Numbers chapter 30, chapter 35. I want to read it from ESV. It says, you shall not pollute the land in which you live. For blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it. 
except by the blood of the one who shed it. He's coming to a conclusion. He's justifying the brother that is killing a, bro a man that has killed his brother. He's saying when this brother died in the land and the blood was shed, the only way the land could be cleansed, it is for the blood of the person that is shed it to be shed. I want to read King James. It says, so you shall not pollute the land wherein you are. For blood it, for blood it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So, the brother has died accidentally. We can't call it accidentally until the person who killed this brother runs in the seat of refuge, as it's written in the entire chapter of the book of Numbers chapter 35. And he stands before the priest, in one, the, 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 the rulers of the city, in one of the places, whichever the place he has run to, and he stands there and explains how innocent he was. And the Bible says they will want to check the history, his relationship with the dead person, to find out whether it was a premeditated kind of death or it was pure accident. They would also study the kind of weapons that were used when this man died. If it was a spear, you couldn't say, I never, never planned. They realized this is something you thought about. This is something you sat down and decided to kill. If it was a stone, the same way. But if it was an axe that slipped over the head and it got this brother, you couldn't stop there to explain what happened because your explanation could not cleanse the land. The blood that has already been shed has defiled the land. And God is giving them the law and the law is, until the blood of this person that is shed this blood is shed by the brother, which is now Goel, that we, we saw last, last Thursday, then the blood, the land can go back to its former condition. The people of Israel could defile the land by the blood that has been shed and no one was taking responsibility. And if this man ran into the city of refuge, he waited there. And he couldn't go free because there was a death sentence hanging over his head. The death sentence was the avenger. And we said the word avenger is spelled G-O-E-L, Goel. Which means the brother of the deceased who has the responsibility to bring the justice in the land. Has the responsibility to redeem the property and his brother. Has the responsibility according to Deuteronomy 25, to marry the wife of the deceased. So we realize when Jesus calls himself, or the Bible calls God a redeemer, it means he is vested with the three responsibilities. And each one of the responsibility has a stage under which it is executed. And we have to understand in the plan of redemption, what is stage of the brother, what is stage of the brother's role are we today? Redemption of the property, redemption of the man, the marrying of the wife of his deceased brother, or avenging. We know avenging is going to take the judgment. Let's not deal with that right now. But we know exactly redemption has already affected the people who are related to this man, Jesus Christ. But now we saw, I don't go back, we saw that the, the, the generation that is raised by Jesus Christ, the tribe that is raised by Jesus Christ, the people that are raised by Jesus Christ, he only does that so that his brother can have his people back with the same authority, the same power, the same dominion that God gave them in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. So Jesus Christ comes under the laws of redemption to redeem his brother's property, to redeem the brother, to marry the wife of his brother, with, the, with the, in this sense is the church, to bring out the children so that they could occupy the inheritance of their father. And these people are found in Romans chapter 8. The people that the nature is crying for their manifestation. So we realize in the book of Numbers chapter 25, it is talking about a blood that has been shed. 
And this blood that has been shed, it says the person that shed the blood must actually be killed. So we are talking today about understanding the two death of the sons of God. Understanding the two death, plural, of the sons, plural, of God. These two sons of God is the first Adam, as it's written in the book of 1 Corinthians 15.45. God is considering death of two sons. So we want to deal with the death of both of them within a short time. We don't have to take three hours. We can only communicate the concept and people understand. The two death that they rock the kingdom of God is the death of Adam and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the two that we can get expressly. The Bible calling them the sons of God. Gabriel told Mary, he that shall be born out of you shall be called the son of the most high God. And in the book of Luke, while the Bible is still is showing us the generation of the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes to a place, he says, who was the son? He said, the son of Adam, who was the son of God. So Adam is called the son of God. Jesus is called the son of God. All the two people or the two sons of God died. And we have to understand the depth and how it impacts and affects we people. Because these two deaths are the death of two people that were heads of races. Adam was the head of a race. Jesus Christ is the head of a race. And their death are not the same. The death of Adam has a category and the death of Jesus has a category. Now we realize in the book of second, the book of Genesis chapter one, um, chapter two, verse 17, the moment you eat of that tree, you shall die. And actually Adam died. But the death of Adam was not a death of redemption. It was not a death that was going to ransom anyone, including himself. The death that Adam incurred was the death of a guilty person. But that death never had a payment of the loss of God as yet said about it. God required someone to die. But praise the Lord. As we look in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, the moment you eat of the tree, you shall die. It does not talk about a substitute of another death. It is God who is just showing you will die. And I want to say maybe Adam never realized someone is going to come and die for him. Because that was a secret that God wanted to reveal. But now in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, God promises a seed. And he talks about, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise the hill. There is always the promise of another death. And this death is not going to be like the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to be like the death of Adam. It's going to be a death. Inside this death is going to be a penalty that is going to be paid. What Adam did by breaking the laws of God, there is another death that is going to pay for it. In the book of Romans, it says the penalty that the wages of sin is death. It goes to show the law of God required a death. And the death would be the death that will require. The death that will pay what Adam did. Now we are confronted with the scripture here. I hope I'm not very fast. We are confronted with the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Chapter 21, God is still dealing with the two deaths here. Chapter 35 of the book of Numbers, he is dealing with two deaths here. He is dealing with the death of one person that died and dealing with the death of another person. So if a brother died in the woods, there still was another death that was supposed to take place. So the land is cleansed. So we realize there is the blood that condemns the land and there is the blood that justifies the land. And these two deaths in the book of uh, Numbers chapter 35, not going with the all context from the beginning of the cities of refuge. We are not dealing with the entire context, but we are dealing with the context of where one person died and the land was polluted and another person has to die for the land to be cleansed. Right there, we are confronted with the two types of death. We are confronted with the two lives. 
And the two lives, as I said from the beginning, is the life of Adam and the life of the second Adam. The first death, which is the first son of God, this is the way it rocked the kingdom of God. It made the whole land guilty. And the second death of another son of God cleanses the whole land and makes the land justified again. And that's why we are talking about understanding the two deaths, plural, of the sons, plural, of God. The, the death of Adam condemned the whole earth. Through that, sin found a way to enter into the earth. And the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, sin was bundled and it was going away from the earth. If you could only but believe, the only sin that God has given us is the sense that will help us to believe. I want us just to type that up as we go to the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 19. It says something very interesting here. It says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. So we realize the disobedience of Adam brought death to the earth and made all men sinners. Then the obedience of the Lord Jesus made, came to the earth and made people rush us again. But we can only conduct that by faith in him. Let me go a little bit here. So when we are tying this together, we realize the Bible says the blood pollutes or rather defiles the land except another blood is shed Praise the Lord by the person that shed that blood. Now, so the question is, how does the land go back to its former state by the death of another blood? And the death of another life, which is the shedding of another blood. How could that be pinned to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because there is only one blood that justifies the earth and brings the earth to its former condition. And that's why I'm taking these two verses to meet my text here of talking about the two deaths here. One death has condemned a person and has polluted the whole land. Then God has another law to cleanse the land. It's very interesting to find even the books of the Muslim. The Quran, of course the Quran, they sort, of, they sort of take the Old Testament. In their book, in the book of Ecclesiastes, or some type of an Ecclesiastes, they say, without the remission, or without the blood, there is no remission of sin. It puts Christianity as a very different kind of religion at all. It's the religion of the blood. Is the religion that it begins by people understanding the guiltness of the blood that was shed and the justification that comes by another blood that is also shed. How do we understand the depth of the death of Adam? We want to see how deep this death went and how you could not run away from it. So when we come to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, we are confronted with another death that has taken place among the children of Israel. What is God doing? God is typing in symbols the plan of redemption depicted in the Bible. He's using types and shadows to show us one story, redemption. And this redemption revolves around two lives. The life of Adam the head of the first race, and the life of Jesus, the head of the second race. That is where redemption is hinging itself. One is coming from the Old Testament, another one is coming from the New Testament. The Bible says very clearly, death reigned in the Old Testament, but New Testament, life started reigning and triumphing over death. So these two bloods, we are confronted with them. We are confronted with the two bloods in Numbers chapter 35. We are also confronted with the same blood, another, uh, the same two types of blood in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, 21. So the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, someone has been found dead in a city. And the death of this person has already polluted the land because God says blood pollutes the land. So it goes to show even people who are in, in uh, if I would just 
If you could just allow me to say something here. It goes to show people should be responsible of the dead in their land. You can't come here and say, I do not know. This law never existed in Israel. When you woke up in the morning and you found someone is dead, no one saw him. So this blood could not be cleansed by the law of the revenger in Numbers 35. There was no brother who could pursue this man and kill him to cleanse the land. What are we going to do? And the law of God is holy. It says the blood is it says the land defiles, the blood defiles the land. What are we going to do? So God gives them another law. And this other law is going to be another death. Hallelujah. He's going to say, hey man, we found someone dead. So it says, then the elders and the judges shall come forth and they shall measure. Now this is a measurement that is supposed to be done. I'm going to take a few minutes right here because I'm already 25 minutes. I'm going to take um, some few minutes to, to make it 40. I'm not going to take one hour right here. It's a weekday fellowship. Some of you are just coming in to rest over these scriptures. So death has already taken place. The person that has died, we do not know. He died in the night. It was not during the day. Because during the day, maybe people would have understood who killed the person, have known him. And the laws would have been invoked to say, hey, the person that killed this man must be pursued until the land is innocent again. Blood has been shed. So people come to do the measurement. And there are two cities. Maybe it happened in a junction or in a place where the roads meet. Or it happens in a place, you can't say this land belongs to this tribe, this city, because they had cities. For example, you can say this one belongs to Asha or Naphtali or Zebulun or the border. So the elders would come with a measuring reed because everything in the kingdom of God is measured. Holiness is measured. The ark of the covenant is measured. All these things are measured. And there must be something on which this thing I mean, whatever that is supposed to be used for measuring is what God called. That's justice. So we want to take the city, the nearest city, we measure it to the closest. I mean, we measure it, the proximity of this city and the dead body. So two cities are going to be measured right here. Maybe three it was in the junction where the two cities, like, they neighbored each other. And when this has been done, the shortest distance the city that was shorter in distance to the body of the slain, that city was condemned. It was guilty. You couldn't stand up and say, I was not there. I shall come home at 7. I shall come home at 6. I shall come home. I don't leave. All the entire city was condemned. God is telling us the plan of redemption. How the whole world is going to be condemned by the death of one person. Now we want to look at the measurement that is being done. When it's being measured in your life, we realize you cannot escape one man that died and his name is Adam. That's the first death. Hallelujah. All men that came out of Adam, and as you came out of anything, the measurement pins you to do something about that death. You need to do something. The measurement is going to be taken. And when the measurement is taken, it says you are guilty. Because you are born by him. And that's why we come in the book of Job. It says, he, Judges Job chapter 14, he that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. We are all sinners by that measurement. God took the law and measured you, measured what you did, measured your first birth by the word of God. Then you bring in Psalms chapter 51. It says, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was sharpened in iniquity. And in sin, it doesn't matter how holy the wedding was. All the sons that were born out of that, that were born after the commandment was broken. Of Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. A measurement is being done. I wish I had time to deal with the measurement of the law. How the law came to the earth as a measurement to conclude us all guilty. Someone is dead. Adam is dead. Their first death has taken place on the earth. And the death of the son of God. 
This is the first death that is taking place because we are looking at understanding the two deaths of the sons of God. And this man has died and a measurement is being done. It depends you. You could be a white, you could be a black. A tall, a black person, a, a slender, whoever you are. The measurement is being done here and you are found guilty. You can't say I was not here. God is condemning the whole city because of the death of one person. And as we realize in the book of Romans chapter, 50, um, chapter 5 verse 19, it says by one disobedience. Very clearly, it says, for by one disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall men be made righteous. It says, by one offense, sin entered. And the sin that was initially, that was supposed to be, uh, the death that was initially supposed to be your servant becomes your ruler, becomes your king. But after Jesus Christ dies, the death has no power because the sting of death has been removed by the special body of Jesus Christ. So the death now becomes your servant. Should you exit from the earth today, God is going to send your servant and your servant is going to be death that is going to take you into the presence of God. Death is no longer a terror right here. By one man's disobedience, death came into the earth. Praise the Lord. So God is telling them here, if this person is dead and the measurement has been done, the measurement of the city has been done, and the proximity and the distance between the slain and the city calls for the city to be responsible for the death. And in whatever that you are, came from Adam, it says there is something you must do about it. You can't just sit back there and say, hey, I come, I come from work at two. I always was in the house. I heard the noise, whatever. No, 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 no. The blood has polluted the entire land. God is giving them the law, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the priest, the sons of Levi, shall come near for them. The Lord God hath chosen to minister unto him, to bless him in the name of the Lord. By the word shall every controversy and every stock be dried. All the elders of the city, that are next unto the slain man shall wash their, their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. So you are going to take another life, an innocent life, a type of the Lord Jesus. Don't ask me why it was a heifer, it was female. There is something great about that. God is saying this lamb, the, 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 this heifer, it's not a lamb anymore. It has never been used. It has never been yoked. It is never. And for it not to be yoked, it must have come it must have a protection around it. It is waiting for the people who are innocent. People cannot explain who killed these, but they're under condemnation because a death has been found. The reason why we die in the natural, it's a measurement that there is something about the first death. The reason why we die of cancer, we die of this, that is a measurement. We can't escape it, but there is something we can do. We can identify a heifer. We can pick the heifer and take it in the valley and the innocent is going to die and the blood is going to be shed of an innocent and animal so that the land can be cleansed again. That is my Lord Jesus Christ there. That is understanding the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus is going to pay. The death of the heifer is designed to pay for these people. And the Bible says and these people shall take you know that's what Pilate tried to do. They shall take water and wash on top of the sacrifice of this lamb, this heifer that has died in a land and this land had never been cultivated. That goes to represent the heart of a human being. The heart of a human being is a rough place. It's a rugged place. It has never been blown. Whatever that was designed to grow in that heart was never grown. The land has never been grown anything, but the blood is now going direct on that land. Hallelujah. The blood of this heifer is going to be shed on the land that has never been shown so that the law of God can be fulfilled so that the blood can cleanse the land again. We see the blood of the innocent here. We see the blood of the guilty in Numbers chapter 35 is the blood of the guilty. But here is the blood of the innocent. What is the blood of the guilty? What does it stand for? I want to get into that. I'm fearing my time is running. 
But I just have to, to say this. Here is the blood of the innocent standing in for the people who are innocent. But right here, the person that killed it is covered maybe. But what about his conscience? But here, there is a blood that is going for the innocent right here. But in number 35, there is a blood going for the guilty. So God is using all the laws to bring the children of God, to bring all mankind to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding his depth, understanding the depth of his death. It is important for us. Praise the Lord. You can't say, I'm innocent. You can't do it, my brother. The Bible says in the book of Romans, I just want to, 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 to go that to deal with that very fast. Romans chapter 1, those who are putting it down, read it with this kind of conception. Romans chapter 1, Paul is bringing out the guilty among the Gentiles. And the book of Romans is dealing with the two types of people. It's only in the millennium these two types of people are going to be united to be one as they were as one family, the family of Adam. But they were divided when God was dealing with Israel in the Old Testament. And this thing is very important. So the book of Romans, Paul is coming in Romans chapter 1 and is proving by the measurement we are realizing. He is measuring the things the Gentiles do and he's telling them a very important word. He says even these Gentiles, the thing they do, they have a conscience that testifies of them of a God before that God is even preached. And they are measured and found innocent. No, found guilty by the things they do even without the preaching of the law. And the preaching of the gospel. So Romans chapter 1, genders are guilty. Then he comes to Romans chapter 2. Those of you who are, who are studying this, you'll understand Romans chapter 2, he is not dealing with the Gentiles. He is dealing with the Jews. For example, look at this word he's using here. Verse 17, chapter 2 verse 17 says, Behold thou art called a Jew. And rested in the law and maketh thyself boast of God, and knoweth his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed of the law. Are thou confident that thou thyself art a, a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law? Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou preachest a man should not steal. Does thou steal? He is talking about the things found among the Jew with the measurement of the law. When he's going to Romans chapter 1, he's dealing with the conscience of the people that testify of the presence of God. And they do things against their conscience. With the conscience is connected to God. The measurement is done about the man that is dead and they are found guilty. Romans chapter 2, a measurement is taken to the Jews. They are found guilty. Romans chapter 3, what advantage then had the Jew? What profit is there of circumcision? Much, much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Then he comes around. He describes what they do. Then he comes to the word that we all of us know. It says, for all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. What is he saying? He's proving that all the Gentile and the Jew, the measurement has been taken. The Gentiles are guilty. The Jews are guilty. Verse 19 says, Now we know that what things or servant the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth must be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So chapter 3, the whole world was guilty of that death of a slain man in the city. The whole world is guilty. So chapter 4, Paul is now going to enter into justification. He's coming into justification of another man. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, that's about the Jews, had he, 
He had wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what say the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. For to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of adept. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that, that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. For even as David has also described, the blessedness of the man under whom God imputed righteousness without works. Paul is going to address the condition of the Gentiles, which are also the sons of Abraham by faith. The condition of the Jews, who are also guilty in chapter 2. They are going to be justified because God is going to justify someone. The death has been found. The death of Adam and then the death of Jesus. By the death of Jesus, all the guilty are going to be justified. Consider the death of this man. Consider the depth of the death of this man. He came in to justify the people. I want to run now. 40 minutes. I want to run something here in Isaiah 53. The depth of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's measured, the Bible says we are all guilty. And we are guilty of the death of Adam. But there is another guilt that comes around. The guilt of the death of Jesus by refusing to accept him. Him that justified the Jew and the Gentile. Him that justified the sinner. All of us are concluded. There is no person here according to the measurement of Paul that is innocent. All of us are guilty. Now the whole world is standing guilty. But in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, the city stood guilty until a heifer is killed. We all stood guilty until a type of a heifer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second death after the first death, the second death justifies, the second death forgives, the second death reconciles, the second death restores, the second death makes you wider than snow, the second death God says, Come, let us reason together. Come, let us reason about the death of the person found in your life, in your body. You are carrying the carcass. You are carrying a corpse. You are born in sin. You are born dead. But now there is another man. The Bible calls Adam the living soul. But it calls Jesus the quickening spirit. The death of Jesus can quicken every son of God that comes in faith. I thank God for the two deaths that rocked the family of God. The two deaths that impacted humanity. One condemned us, another one justifies us. One brings life, another one took away life. And I want to say when Paul stands around and says, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I thank God who gives us victory in Christ Jesus. The death of Jesus was not like the death of Adam. If you died in sin, it doesn't do anything to the kingdom of God. The Bible says God delights in the death of the saint. How does God do it? He rejoices over that death because of one simple reason. You've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been justified by faith in him. God has already concluded. He already finished what he's doing. Right now, Isaiah 53. It says this, talking about the Lord Jesus. It says in verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief, and we did as it were, hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of who? Smitten of God. Let me go back to Numbers 35 right here. Numbers 35, one man was innocent. No? One man was guilty by killing his brother. But Jesus comes around, takes that death. Look at how the Bible is written. It takes the death of the guilty as it's written in the book of uh, First Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18, it talks of the death of the just for the unjust. Number 35, someone is who? He is guilty for killing another man. But in the death of Jesus, he says, you are running. You, you are running with a sword. You are going after Simon because Simon accidentally killed your brother and Simon is guilty. And the blood, the land is guilty. 
because Simon has shed blood. So Jesus Christ comes. Hallelujah. When I've been found and the sword is coming over me on my head, Jesus comes very fast, stands between me and the sword, and the sword goes through him, and the blood is shed, and the gland the land is cleansed again. Then Simon, he doesn't even have to go to a temporal city of refuge because now the death, the sword of the avenger has found another person. Oh man, that one is not written there. But that's how Jesus took the death. Jesus took in the, into himself the sword of the avenger that was coming for you. And Jesus took it upon himself. You don't even have to go literally. That's why there are no cities of refuge in the New Testament. If it has to be taken word for word. Although we know the Bible tells us the name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. But I want to tell you, if someone took your death while you are running the seed of refuge, you can stop and go back home. Because that day, they waited for Simon to come to his family. Simon could not come. And people would come and report to the family and say, Simon, when he went out to walk out there, in the forest or in the woods, accidentally the axe head slipped from the, from the handle and it killed his friend. So he cannot come home until the death of the high priest that was anointed with oil dies with the death sentence of Simon. Then on that day of the death of the high priest, brother, there is a release. People can go back to their inheritance. Those who are bound in Kadesh, one of the cities of refuge, Hebron, Shechem, Ramoth Gilead. What is the other city right there? Hebron, Kadesh, Ramoth Gilead. Colon Heights, all those people who are there, they emptied those cities. They were running. Where are they going? We are going back home because what? The high priest has died and inside him he took my death. That is Jesus Christ, a priest under the order of Melchizedek that died 2,000 years ago that we could be free from the place where we are hiding. We can be free and meet the person that was against you, stand in the word of God that condemned you and say, death, where is thy victory? Where is thy sting? Because the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the death of this son of God. He comes as a priest. He comes as a lamb. He comes as a god. He comes as a bullock. He comes as a dove. He comes as a heifer here. One thing is to address a people that are ready to be justified by faith in Christ Jesus. You can go free. I want to say there is another emptying out of coming. Another emptying. When he cries again, with the trump of God, there will be an emptying. We shall see on Sunday. People are going to be emptied. Emptied from the pavilion where God has hid them. In the courts of God where people have been hid in different compartments. Different furniture places. From the brazen altar all the way to the altar of incense. These places are compartments in the kingdom of God, depending on how you died, the way you live today will prove where you will go should you exit the earth. But there is a time there is going to be an emptying and people are going to come. I want to tell you, you are dead. You are freedom, according to Numbers chapter 35, depended on the length of the life of the high priest. If you went in the city of refuge, brother, and the high priest dies tomorrow, you would go free. But if the high priest lived for 90 years, 80 years, and you are there, you would stay there for a long time. I want to tell you from Adam, from Adam, since we were condemned, up to the death of the Lord Jesus, 4,000 years, people living in paradise. But on the day he cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sapatagan. When he cried, there was an emptying. The Bible said the bodies, because the high priest has died. People who lived in this one type of a place called the paradise could come out. For 40 days they lived on earth. I want to tell you there is another emptying, just like the emptying of the Old Testament. The Bible says, time is coming and now is. Those who are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they shall resurrect. Another resurrection has taken place. There is another one that we are coming for. It is this man who took the, the, the sword of the revenger. Hallelujah. Took it in himself that I could go free. 
Then we find in the book of Isaiah right here, the Bible says here, he was smitten of God and afflicted. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. Let me go back. It says, and we hid as it were our faces. Jesus Christ became so ugly. Why? Because upon Jesus was every sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He that was sinless was made sin that we may become righteous. No, that we may become the righteousness of God. If you are looking for a righteous God, there is a people that God is going to make righteous who believe the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. By his resurrection, we were justified. There are righteous people on earth today. There are people who are wearing Je Jehovah Sikenu. There are people who are hearing the life of the branch. That is Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33. There are righteous people after he died and resurrected. And then the Bible says here, Jesus Christ took every sin. So I want to say, and the Bible does, does say something there. By his stripes we are healed. What does that mean, brother, sister? It means every cancer, be it of the throat, be it of tum the tumor of the, of the head, the eye, barrenness, everything, Jesus took it. Today, you can get a miracle. Sometimes God is waiting for you to get a miracle. Not a normal, natural happening, but it's something that could take place in your life. And that's what God is doing today. Jesus Christ, you couldn't look at him in the spiritual world. I want you to look at the people who are people that have got maybe the cans of the tongue. It is swollen that you can't even look at them twice. There are people who are sick, you can't look at them. But look at Jesus at that one moment. Cans of the uterus, cans of every place. Everything was upon Jesus. Took all the sickness right there. And that's the reason even if you get sick, you can be healed. Because Jesus already took the life of sickness. By his stripe, every stripe was not like a stripe like this. It's like Jesus, when you looked at him, when he accepted the will of God and took the sins of men, you couldn't look at his face. I want you to imagine all the sinuses taking place on the earth today. If it was about this 8.5 billion people on earth going through one nose of Jesus. All the cancers, all the diseases Jesus took. But what about all the sin? Sickness is a result of sin. Death is a result of sin. If Jesus Christ never accepted sin, he could still be alive today because in his body there was no cell that death could touch. Let's go until we come to our, to our finish. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have done everyone to his own way. And the Lord had slayed upon him the iniquity of us all. We couldn't look at Jesus Christ because of his appearance. He's not the person you could look at when he took the sins of the world. All the sins of the world on a person. An innocent. The depth of the death of the second son of God. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He brought us as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the Hashirahs. Is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased her love it. It's, it's ironic. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the land after the death of this man. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he, has shall, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the strong. There is a spoil to be divided. Jesus is going to give you the keys of death and hell. He's going to give everything. There is a division of the spoil because of this death. We are going back to the eternal youth. Because he has poured out his soul unto the death, and he has numbered, he was, and he was numbered with the transgression, transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors.
understanding the two death of the Son of God. Praise the Lord. We are back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21. We have offered the heifer by faith on a racket land. You are land that is so racket, so rough. There is nothing good coming out of it. The place that had no grain, the place that had been set aside for the grain, for the corn, for the pomegranates, for the olive, nothing is sold in that land. But this heifer is going to be killed, slain because of an innocent or maybe a dead person that was found in the land of Israel. This heifer is going to die. That will justify the many. The land can be innocent again because of the death of the innocent. That Christ Jesus can impart upon you his own life that you can conduct him by faith and believe him irrespective of what you know. May God speak to you today. You that are saved, you that are looking for salvation, may God come into your life as you study the death of Adam, the first son of God, and the death of Jesus, the second son of God, and be able to know one death justifies, another death condemns. One death pollutes the land, another death cleanses the land. By one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. Not by two sacrifices. Brothers, don't bring the Old Testament thing here. We're here to die over and over. The Bible says by one death, not two. One death he has perfected forever. Those that believe him. You will believe today and know you have got the authority and the power to pray for the sick. Why do we still get sick? There is a body, this body, the, this body death runs in it. it is, it's not immortal. It is mortal body. You know how we get the word mortuary? Mortuary means a place for the mortals. God has got a better body for you. Don't say, why do I still get sick? And the reason why we get ill today, it goes to show there is a body somewhere that can never get sick. That's the reason when we are prayed for, we believe. When you are prayed for and you are believing to be healed, you are believing for something big. You are believing there is another body somewhere that death and sickness cannot touch. And God is going to bring the breeze the breeze is going to blow from that perfect body in Christ Jesus and is going to come upon you and God will heal you tonight. Can you believe together with me? If you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you could do it right now. Something could change in your life right now. A sickness could go right now because of the authority of the Lord Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you again on this great dust that you've given us, Lord, to understand the depth of the death of Adam the depth of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That man can be justified. The sickness can be conquered. Through the faith in Jesus. Healing can be done, O oh Father. Cancer can fall off today. Barrenness can be open, O oh Father. Restoration could be done, Father. Consolation could be done and comfort among your people today. People, sinners can be saved today. The guilty can be made innocent. The unrighteous can be made righteous today. Because of the faith we have in Jesus. You've commit, commanded us. Preach the gospel. Go into the whole world and that's what we are doing, Lord, today. Today, Father, we believe there will be a peace that will prevail upon your people. Father, women, men, oh, Father, that the people that are guilty in that home because of the slain, oh, Father, could be made justified by the secret of the sacrifice of the Hepha slain in the valley, Lord. Oh, God, that you came and took the sword of the avenger. Things could be done today in the mighty name of Jesus. We bless you, Father. Heal the sick who can be able to touch you like the woman that took the hem of your garment. You can forgive today if people will allow all the hassles and the bustles of their life to go away, that they can be silent today on a Thursday to conduct you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, heal that sick person. Restore that backslider, Father. Bring them back into the fall, O oh God, as this message goes out to your people. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we've prayed and believed, thanking you for the death of the just for the unjust. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. We appreciate you. We shall be seeing you again. God giving us grace in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Shalom. Have a restful night. Amen.